Hey, All right, coach, Dennis, go ahead. Coach, I know um, when you were giving us a checklist, whether it was loaves, uh, no loaves, effort, tackling, um, is our first chance to really get your assessment. What did you see? What impressed you? And what, uh, what do you got to build on? Well, uh, it, it was game one. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, we were pleased with or, or encouraged by uh, in game one. And uh, a couple of them that you just mentioned there, first started with the effort. We, uh, we really thought that our, our guys played uh, really hard in that game. Um, they were ready physically to go. And uh, we executed at a high level. So mentally, we were prepared uh, to go out and execute the defense and um, do it consistently. So I, I was pleased with the effort. Uh, I was uh, pleased with the execution. Fundamentally, we used our hands. Uh, we tackled pretty well for the first game uh, with limited tackling and training camp. So all of those things uh, I'm encouraged by, um, not, not happy. Um, you know, uh, we haven't arrived and, and we're not a finished product by any means, but definitely encouraged by some of the things that we saw from that standpoint. Anwar, yeah, Coach, um, kind of playing a little bit off of uh, Dennis's question, you know, when you have, you know, practices is one thing, walkthroughs another, but then having real game reps and being live is totally different. I I'm kind of curious with now working with them in, in a game, uh, what did you think about, you know, your unit? What did you learn more specifically about those guys that maybe you didn't necessarily see in practices, uh, but maybe their spots is good or bad, but what did you learn about those guys after the game? Well, you mentioned uh, being able to take practice uh, reps and practice execution and apply it to game day. That's probably the number one thing that jumped out at us that we were concerned about. Are, are we going to be able to do that with a new defense, new fundamentals in, in the stadium on game day against an opponent? And uh, we, we were most pleased by that, that uh, what we were asking our guys to do, you could see it. Um, they understood it. Uh, it was crystal clear uh, what we were asking them to do You know, from just watching the film. Uh, so we were really pleased about that, that uh, our guys know our system, understand our system, uh, could go out and execute it and, uh, you know, not, not basically go rogue and do their own thing and um, really encouraged by that. And uh, we need to continue to build on that. Uh, it, we saw those things in practice. You know, I think when we first talked before we played, I told you I was encouraged by what I'd seen in practice. I thought we were further ahead than I thought we might be. And uh, we saw a lot of the things that we saw in practice show up on game day. And, and that's really what we want, that practice execution showing up on the game field. And uh, we need to build on that. We, you know, we need to continue to improve in a lot of areas, uh, but uh, uh, pleased by what we saw. Chip, go ahead. Chris, what do you like about uh, Keandre Coburn and Tavandre Sweat? Huh. First of all, I like uh, their personalities. Uh, that would be the first thing. I love being around those guys. They're, they're funny guys. A um, lot of uh, fun to be around in the meeting rooms and on the practice field. But uh, I love their size and, and their explosiveness. Those guys are big. They're strong. They're athletic for their size. Uh, they're going to be really tough to handle on the inside there with uh, what we're asking them to do. So I love them as people. Um, and uh, I love what they can bring to our defense uh, out there from a phys physicality standpoint. Um, they're also pretty good pass rushers for their size, too. Mike, go ahead. Hey, Coach, I wanted to ask you about DeMarvian Overshawn. He, talk, Overshawn, he talked to us uh, and let us know that y'all had a conversation for him to make that transition to that position on the weak side. And he seems to enjoy the move now. He's playing closer to the line of scrimmage. Can you talk, take us behind that conversation and, and what made him and what helped you convince him to take that position seriously? Well, it, it all starts um, when I first got here, really evaluating our personnel. Uh, we knew that we were kind of uh, top heavy in certain spots in the DB position, the safety positions uh, specifically. We were really uh, loaded up there uh, and we had some needs in other positions. So as we were evaluating the personnel, we had to try to identify who we could move, um, whose body, whose skill set could potentially fit at a different position. Uh, we didn't make those decisions until we got a chance to watch every, everybody move and run around, but we watched film on him. Um, we looked at his measurables. You know, the kid had length, he had size, he had uh, room to grow. He could run. He was one of the tougher players on the team. Uh, we had a huge need at linebacker. So, you know, after the first uh, time we got a chance to watch him work out and move around, you know, we just had an open, honest conversation, I believe, in, in, in the transparency. And he said, what do you think? And I said, well, you've got a choice to make. You know, you're either going to have to uh, make a lot of sacrifices uh, to cut weight and, and try to slim down to stay a, a safety or just let your body naturally grow and go work hard and, and, and make the move down to linebacker. And I think you'd have a chance to be a special one. And, um, he said, really? And I said, yeah. 
And uh, that was really the extent of the conversation. I think back, uh, just you know, listening to him talk, I think in the back of his mind, he knew that that uh, at some point would be his future. Um, he just didn't know when, and he was trying to uh, continue to uh, see himself as a DB. Uh, but I think it was the right time, the right decision, and he's all in. And um, you know, he did a great job in the first game. Steve, you're up. Hey, coach. Uh, getting back to to the linebackers a little bit. This is you know when you're playing a run and shoot type team or an air raid type team, the linebackers' uh, importance has stepped up a little bit more in, the, in a passing game. I mean, this seems like a game that the Marvion should shine for you guys. Um, talk about how your linebackers are coming along as a whole. Yeah, well, it just. Uh, Playing a team like this, they do put a lot of stress on the perimeter of your defense and, and the under coverage in your defense. And uh, that, that's why we talk about needing linebackers that can run sideline to sideline and play out in space. And I think, you know, the Chris Adamoras, the Overshans, the Bendas, the Anthony Cooks, that's why we made the moves with those guys, uh, because we knew we were going to need linebackers that could do that in this league. And we're hoping that those moves will help us in games like this. Um, to be able to do that, uh, be able to make those plays out in space. Um, it's going to be a hu huge test. This is a, a great challenge for us to go play on the road against an offense that's going to stress a position like this offense will. Um, and we're going to find out if the position changes uh, you know, we made for this particular side of offense will work. And um, we're, we're excited about it, but we also understand that we got to go play ex exceptionally well. Kirk, go ahead. Yeah, Chris, a uh, two-part question. Uh, one is Alan Bowman, your typical flinging it Texas Tech quarterback. And uh, how does an Oklahoma guy like Matt Wells come in and have success at a Texas Tech long term? Uh, well, I'm, I'm really impressed by Bowman from what I've seen, both uh, watching him early last season before he was injured and then in last week's game. He can sling it. Uh, he can make a lot of throws. He's uh, got a, a good presence in the pocket. Um, he's going to be a great challenge for us. They've got the outstanding receivers. Uh, they go really fast, extremely fast. Uh, that's going to stress us defensively. And, and then, then when you put a quarterback back there, that can make the throws that he can. Um, you know, we've got to be at our best on Saturday. Uh, in, in terms of uh, Matt Wells, I've known Matt for a while. Matt's a great guy, a great coach. Uh, he'll, he'll do a great job uh, wherever he's at. Um, but you'd have to ask him how he's going to do it there in, in, in Lubbock. But, um, you know, I, I have uh, no doubt that uh, he'll do a great job. Joe, you're up. Coach, I wanted to ask you about the Adivis tackling system. I, I spoke with, with Rex, who said, he said he knew you. And while y'all officially did not get that service for here at Texas, I was wondering maybe your connections with him and your connections with that system and why it's basically the tackling system that you believe in as a defensive coordinator. Yeah, I got connected with Rex back in 2014. And I, I think... Uh, uh, Adivis and, and Rex uh, specifically do a great job, and it's a resource that, uh, honestly, I wish more coaches would take advantage of, both at the college level, high school level, because, it, it, it like we've talked here before, I mean, uh, player safety is at the forefront of everything that we do, and if you want to you know, put player safety at the, at the front of your program uh, as well as uh, implement a technique that's going to help you improve uh, your players, I think the uh, rugby tackling or shoulder tackling technique is, is it. And, and those guys are at the forefront uh, of teaching it uh, and evaluating it. And uh, I uh, got connected with Rex back in 2014. He really uh, helped me a lot in, in understanding uh, the drills uh, and the progressions of, of uh, the installation of tackling. Uh, and I've been using um, him as a resource ever since. And uh, they've really developed uh, their analysis of tackling um, and, and how they evaluate you know, you're, you're tackling uh, after a game and, and uh, after practices, uh, and he's really been a valuable tool for me. So uh, I can't uh, say enough about Rex and Adibus and, and the, the job that they do to try to help this game. Chris, you have a question? Hey, Chris, um, it's been 11 years since you were last in the Big 12, uh, and, you know, the Big 10 and the SEC aren't necessarily known as as these high-powered offenses that, that the Big 12 is. How do you think um, – it'll be once you get into that fully, you had the UTEP game, but Texas Tech is kind of maybe a little less so under Matt Wells, but the, the, the biggest example of, you know, the, the sling it all over the field, high powered offense in the league. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think when you look at uh, just college football in general, um, there are a lot of high powered uh, offenses, uh, you know, in uh, college football, um, but there are also some pretty good defenses in certain leagues uh, as well. 
um, you know, this league, uh, it is what it is. I mean, everybody's knocking this league for what? Because they feel uh, that the defense hasn't been uh, played uh, the way that it, it has in other leagues. And our job is to try to change that. And uh, it's not going to be an easy one. Uh, there are great coaches in this league. There are tremendous skill players uh, in this league. There are good quarterbacks. Uh, these guys have great systems. Uh, I, I'd say probably the biggest difference, it's not the schemes that people are employing in this league versus the other leagues. This league seems to have more tempo in it than, than some of the other leagues. And when you put uh, the, the, the talented players, the good coaches, the good quarterbacks with tempo, uh, that, that package uh, of things uh, make it more difficult defensively to have success. Um, so uh, it is going to be a challenge. I'm, I'm excited to go through this league. I've studied the league. Um, I know what it's uh, been about in the past. I know, you know, the challenges that lie ahead uh, th this Saturday specifically in Lubbock. Uh, they're, they're, they're really uh, 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 big ones. But, um, you know, I'm excited to, to prepare our players and, and our defense to go out and, and uh, do something that uh, people think can't be done in the Big 12, and that's play really good defense. Chip, go ahead. Chris, obviously, uh, Josh Thompson had a, a nice debut. Can you talk about your evaluation of him uh, and moving him to corner? Yeah, I, I'm really high on Josh. I think Josh is an exceptional player. Uh, he's a very talented player. He's very serious about what he does. He works extremely hard. Um, he's he's uh, established himself as one of our leaders um, through his play and through his work. And he had a great night in the, in the opening game. And I'm very excited to watch uh, how he grows and develops as we go through the season. But I'm, I've been around some outstanding defensive backs. And I would put Josh in, in the category uh, with some of the best ones I've been around you know, early on so far. Now he's got to go out and perform that way consistently throughout the season. But um, I, I hope we have a lot of fun watching him make plays here throughout the year. Kirk, you have a question? Yes. Uh, do you know how many missed tackles y'all had, Chris? in the UTEP game? We, we were in single digits. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really what we look at. Um, you know, if we can keep our missed tackles in the single digits in, in, in a game, especially in this league, uh, you're tackling at a high level. So we, we were in the single digits. And, and when I'm talking about missed tackles, I'm talking about just really your open field, you know, one-on-one -on -one situations. But uh, overall, it, I thought it was an outstanding first game um, uh, for us to tackle. And I know you're not studying the tech defense, but have you seen Colin Schooler? And I was curious what your impressions of him as a linebacker, if you've seen him play. You, you know, uh, um, I'm not studying uh, tech's defense. I haven't watched him all at tech. Uh, I did watch him at Arizona, though. Um, last year, uh, we, we watched a lot of, obviously, Texas Tech film from last year. And Arizona was one of the tapes that we watched. And he was a linebacker for Arizona. So, um, saw him in, uh, in an Arizona uniform and uh, kid made a lot of plays. He was all over the field, very active. Mike, go ahead. Coach, I wanted to ask you about Chris Adamora. We talked to Caden Stearns yesterday and, and he had a bunch of high praise for his work ethic and how he came in and, and kind of took over that position. And how, is, how important is that spur position with this type of defense that you're playing? Um, it's very important. I think it's one of the more difficult positions to play. I think he's, he's in a position that he's going to have to make a lot of plays. Uh, zone coverage, man coverage, pressure, making tackles out in space the way college football is right now uh, out to the field and all the bubbles and the RPOs and the, the now screens that, that the uh, people employ. Uh, so we need a player out there with, with a unique skill set. And kind of like we talked about Overshawn, you know, we had a conversation with Chris as well. Uh, as we were evaluating our, our personnel um, and looking at what we wanted to do, who could we put in that position? And he was one of the first guys that we identified uh, with. Um, and again, he, he was uh, all in. And uh, when, when we, we went through the job description of that position and said that we think that you can uh, excel here. Uh, he took it, he ran with it, and he's worked extremely hard to learn it. Uh, he practices hard every single day. He wasn't perfect in game one. Um, there are some plays that he'd like to take back. Uh, but I tell you what, he's worked really hard here the last two weeks to try to uh, improve on it. We've got three last questions in queue. We'll go ahead and wrap those up. Uh, go ahead, Chip. Um, Chris, real quickly, on just finishing up on Josh Thompson, what specifically did you see in the evaluation? Because I think you made the decision to move him to corner before you ever got to really work with him. And then secondly, um, how's B.J. Foster doing? Uh, to, so talking about Josh, we watched film on Josh uh, from his past, and 
in, in some of our uh, morning workouts, watching the players run and change direction, not, not necessarily uh, positional work, but just with the strength staff. Uh, we were looking for guys with feet and hips that could do what we wanted to do with our corners. And Josh, you know, he stood out. You know, he's got size. He's got great feet. He's got good hips. Um, he has really the, the, the package and the combination of, of uh, skill sets that we want uh, at that position. So it was pretty easy and pretty uh, quick. It was a quick evaluation to say, hey, we need to put this guy at corner. So um, that, that's really how that decision was made uh, through uh, game film from the past and just watching him work out with the strength staff. And then BJ's doing great. Dennis, go ahead. Uh, your first game look at, at Alfred Collins. Uh, it's kind of cool he got a sack. What 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 is gonna what are the things you need to work with him to to achieve the what looks like could be greatness out of him? Yeah, um, I, I hate to, to to throw the uh, label greatness uh, on a true freshman, but I, I think this kid's got a chance to be really special. I, I really do. Uh, for a true freshman uh, to move like he does with his size, there's not a lot of them out there. I mean, the kid's got a chance to be uh, outstanding. Um, he needs to learn the position. He needs to learn how to use his hands, play with better pad level, uh, things like that, that that most freshman defensive linemen have to to learn. Uh, but he's 6'5", and to play on the inside, he's got to play with better pad level and some better technique. But um, you know what we've seen so far, we think he has a chance to be pretty special. He's tough. He's athletic. Uh, he's competitive. Um, and uh, I, I think the sky's the limit for him. He works really hard at it, too. Last one. Go ahead, Marcus. Yeah, uh, you've already talked about you know, Chris Adamore and Josh Thompson. Um, how much of an advantage was it for you coming into this program to have a lot of defensive backs returning that had you know, not only played together but knew the expectations of the program as a whole? Well, it's made it an easier transition to have so many guys that have some game experience and have been around here for a while. Um, they've got really good football IQ. Um, they, they picked up on things well. Um, even if we were asking them to do something completely different from the past, you know, they, they, they understood it and they were able to take it from the meeting room to the practice field and, and uh, last Saturday to the game field for the most part. And uh, that, that's definitely helped. Uh, you were not dealing with a bunch of young players that uh, are inexperienced, never played. Uh, it, it's made it a smoother transition. So we're, we're benefactors of, you know, some good recruiting and, and some good players in those rooms and, and uh, good coaching. That's usually what it is. You got some good players around you. Coach, uh, have you ever had a, a quarterback throw for 400 yards, five touchdowns and a half, and then say he's pretty disappointed in his performance? And with that said, how does Sam Ellinger grow under your watch moving forward? I don't know if I ever, I statistically, I can't remember if we have or not, um, but definitely uh, having a quarterback um, be critical of himself after such a, uh, such a performance is, um, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, getting to know Sam, that's very typical of him and how he's approached his preparation at this point. Um, the second part of that question was? How do you help him move forward? Because he's chasing perfection it sounds like well you're always you're always looking for ways to improve and so there's never been a perfect game coached or a perfect game played and so we're just trying to always find ways to get better to correct the mistakes that we made not everybody's perfect maybe it's a misthrow maybe it's a misread maybe it's timing maybe it's footwork um, even though you complete a pass there's certainly things to correct at times based on where your eyes were, how your feet were, um, you know, just the little things and the details. And at the same time, you know, th there's there's a point to where you can overcoach guys, to where you can get them thinking too much and that, you know, they're not feeling it out and, and playing um, intuitively and uh, in rhythm and confidently. So you have to, as a coach, you have to be careful of that, especially when, when you're dealing with a player as, as talented um, as we have is, is you got, sometimes you got to get out of their way. Um, and, and that's, that's the balance, you know, of coaching and, and coaching too much. So you've got to know where that is. And uh, we're always trying to make sure that our players are confident. Um, that, I think that's a, that's a critical element of, of any performer in anything that they do, whether it be broadcast journalism or whether it be playing the piano or playing quarterback, uh, you have to be confident in what you're doing. So, Correcting, but yet building confidence um, is that balance that you're always looking for as a position coach or any coach. 
Brian, go ahead. Yeah, Mike, I actually want to build on that. Um, you know, when you were at Oklahoma State, you know, Mason sort of grew into being Mason Rudolph there. Whereas here, you have a sort of fully developed college player handed to you. And, and I wonder, what what is your personal relationship with Sam like? I mean, do you treat him differently than you would someone who has sort of come into their own on, on your watch? Uh, how, how, how would you compare those two as, as fully formed college quarterbacks? They're all different. Each Every quarterback that I've ever coached is, is different. They're all unique uh, to themselves. Um, and, and how you handle them is the same with regard to being honest and making sure that the lines of communication are open and that you communicate how you're feeling. And sometimes that's good, bad, and the ugly. And, and, but it has to be – that transparency has to be there. And it's a two-way street, you know, and he's very good at communicating. And he's a very honest football player. I heard a quote, uh, one of my buddies, uh, um, former defensive coordinator in the NFL, he said, he said one thing. I, it, it was awesome um, in a Zoom meeting we had. He said, honest football teams win. And I love that comment. I love that, 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 that saying or quote, whatever that is. And, and it's, there's a lot of truth to that. And at quarterback, especially, you have to be honest. What we're in is with honesty is you have to own it, right? You have to own everything that you do. You have to own every mistake. What were you thinking? You have to be honest when you're giving me feedback in between plays, in between series. What were you thinking? I need to know what you were thinking. I'm not here to judge it. I'm here to correct it and get you pointed in the right direction. So tell me exactly what you were thinking. And if it was about last Saturday night's date, I need to know that so we can focus, you know, your brain in the right space. And so he's very good with that. Um, Mason was very good with that. Um, but they are all different in how they learn, how they see things, how you have to communicate and try to find the avenue that best connects their brain. And we're still learning. It's still, it's an ongoing process. Um, it's, it's ever evolving. And uh, I think he's done a great job of, you know, learning my style and, and being able to, you know, he doesn't have to adjust to me, but at the same time, uh, there's, there's, you know, different things you try to think in the same brain waves as far as like anticipating things and so how I'm calling it or how I'm seeing things you know for his ability to quickly adapt to that I think is is awesome and and he's had he's had awesome quarterback coaches I mean all the way through from coach Dodge you know to coach Beck who did a great job with him you know so you know my job is is a little bit of get out of the way you know Bob you're up Mike, is there an ideal um, rotation at running back for you? And, and maybe on a bigger level, what's the biggest challenge in determining Keontae needs to get more touches right now, Roshan needs to get more touches, we need to get Bijan involved? Like, how, how difficult a challenge is that as you go through a game to, to continue a, a rotation and, and get the right guys the right touches at the right time? I think that's the benefit of having an awesome running back coach and Stan Drayton is I don't have to get too involved in that. I let him manage his, his guys, let coach Combe manage his guys. And, and uh, same with coach Bullware. Um, you obviously want to, you know, if the guy's running the ball really well, you want to continue to feed the hot hand, so to speak. And I think that's important. You want to tr try to create rhythm and it's hard to go one Z two Z pull them and play the other guy one z two z and nobody's really getting into the flow and then you know so you're staying fresh you're trying to create rhythm there's a balance um and and we're fortunate to have uh really good um talent in that room but also good teammates as well and that's that's an important element of it because if, if they're not good teammates then it makes it really really hard right because you're you're afraid of shattering an ego and having to deal with all the repercussions um, that, that vibrate off that negativity. So if you have unselfish players, that's, that's the key. And that's what we have. So if they continue to stay unselfish, you know, it makes our job easier. Then we just, you know, kind of feel it out. And I don't think there's any, it's not a, I don't think there's a formula out there. 
I think you lean on uh, an, an expert like Stan and and uh, Coach Herman. You know, his his input as well is very important. And then you go from there. And I, I don't think you overthink it either. Yep. Go ahead. Hey, coaches. I just kind of wanted your philosophy on scripting. I know Coach Herman talked Monday about being on the road and needing to get off to a fast start. And you guys obviously did that against UTEP. But uh, how many plays do you like to script? What goes into that philosophy just for trying to make sure that first drive gets off to a good start? Yes, sir. Great question. Uh, it's a fluid process. And you want to have your starters um, rep several times um, before you, you hit the field Saturday and to give your players um, the list of those plays so they can review in their own time, um, whether it be on the bus ride or the hotel room. So you want to you want to make sure everybody knows and everybody's on the same page with those openers because you want to try to gain momentum and score on that first drive. Very, very important. You know, I like to go even further than that and talk about what our first third down call is going to be, our first short yardage call. You know, hey, if we get the ball on the 40-yard line on the left hash, this is what we're thinking. Um, this is the situation where we're thinking about running the reverse. Um, you know, whatever it is that week that you have in, um, you want to that you're specifically working those calls and that your players can anticipate those calls because it feels really good when you line up and you're anticipating something and it comes in as such, and it just gives everybody confidence and they know what's coming. You know, you don't want to be uh, surprised yet, you know, and, and that's not, that's not good. There are times to do that. And I think that's more about spring ball and fall camp to where you're trying to initiate uh, a little bit of how are they going to react when I surprise them with a call or sit in situation. Um, but you don't want to do that on, on, on when, it, when it's game time, you know, you want to prep them. So um, the, the amount of plays, you know, that's that we're not going to give that away. There's no magic number. I think as a coordinator, you have to know what's too much, um, what plays that you can get away with really not repping a whole bunch because you have a bunch of banked reps in them. So, you know, do we really need to run play that we've been running since day one at camp and we've got a ton of bank rumps, bank reps in it, maybe just hit it once or twice that week and you feel very confident. So you don't surprise your players with that call, but um, repping that play may be a little bit redundant and wasting legs and all that sort of thing. So there's no magic number to it, but you have to understand that um, less is more, um, always will be, always is at the same time, flexibility to adapt to in-game adjustments is that's always got to be a part of a good game plan has the ability to adjust. Right. And so within that game plan, you've got to be able to make certain calls and certain adjustments and have your guys ready and have those discussions on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. So Saturday, it's not brand new. You know, you're not really, you're not really wasting brain space with that. Sometimes you can be occupying brain space, which means you're taking something out you know, where they're forgetting a base rule that they know, but it's just too much thinking going on. So if you add, you have to subtract. But at the same time, you've got to educate your guys throughout the week of, hey, if this, if this were to happen, this could be something that we talk about on the sideline. If this were to happen, this is something that we could get to. No need to worry about it now. But do you understand what I'm saying when I say this? And I hope that makes any a, a little bit of sense to those are important conversations to have, and that's why they give us meetings and we need to utilize them. Hey, Mike. Chip, go ahead. Um, what, uh, what did you like? What didn't you like about your offensive line in that UTEP game? And what, uh, what stands out about Brendan Schooler? Um, I think our offensive line was, was very good um, for the most part. Uh, with, with not allowing any uh, disruption, um, we were headed up consistently. So we, we, there was minimal missed assignments. I like that part of it. Um, I also like our, uh, our focus and our um, awareness of tempo. I think a lot of times offensive linemen are the hardest to convince to go fast, but not with this bunch. They're asking me for tempo. So that's a really, really healthy uh, sign. And uh, I, I love I love that about that group. Um, Schooler, um, he's fast and uh, he's got really good speed. Um, he's a quick study, um, so he'll be able to 
improve, I would say, by leaps and bounds, knowing that he's only had, I don't know how many, 14, 15 practices in, and the rest of them have had uh, triple that. So uh, he's only going to get better. Great kid. Chris, go ahead. Hey, Mike. Um, you, you guys go off for – a million yards and a million points in the first half against UTEP. And I know obviously with a senior quarterback like Sam, he knows to manage expectations, but do you, as, as the offensive coordinator, do you have to kind of manage expectations for the entire offense and let them know, like, this isn't always going to be the norm or do you want them to think that they can go out and do that against anyone? I, I don't put a, like a certain um, number on, on hey, this has to be this, this has to be that. We, we do quality control certain things and have goals. Um, and the most important one is zero turnovers. Well, let me, I, 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 let me retract. The most important is we come away with W, right? We have to win the ball game and whatever that takes, okay? And that, that's what matters. That's one, it's ball security too. And then, you know, then, you know, the things, the goals that we have and the list of the priorities go down from there, obviously. You know, short yardage, you want to be over 80%. Um, so you, you quality control all that stuff, which I don't need to get into every category. And it wasn't quite a million yards and a million points. That'd be nice. But, you know, the goal is to improve, right? The goal is to get better. So that's what the focus is on. It's not about points. It's not about expectations. It's not about what you guys think. It's not about what the fans think. It's not about what their friends think. It's about are we improving as a football team? Are we becoming the best we possibly can be? So we talk about what's important now. Win. W-I-N. What's important now? And, and, and that's the philosophy that it's got to have, right? And, and it's coach speak, but the process, right? The process. And the best teams enjoy that process, right? So that's, that's what it's about, man. And, and otherwise, if you're chasing something else, if you're talking about expectations, whatever, I mean, we, got, we got to beat Texas Tech. That's our expectation. We have to go out and play and beat them. And, and they're going to try to win the game as well. So it's going to be a heck of a competition. And that's what it's all about. That's the fun part, competing, competing, laying it on the line and not caring what the critics say and not caring what the skeptics say and all the criticism and the expectations, because that's the world, right? That's social media, right? And that's, and that's everywhere in these young men's lives. And we have to rein them in on, hey, focus on getting better. I'm preparing. There's joy in that as well. There's fun in that. And, and that's, that's, that's what we have to do as coaches. Got three questions left in the queue. Uh, start with Sam. Hey, Mike, uh, on a normal bye week and a normal season, you would have had a chance last week to go out and see some prospects uh, from a recruiting standpoint. How did not doing that change your workload on a week like last week? And, and also, how does it impact how you evaluate guys not being able to see a quarterback throw live, for example? That's a great question. And it, it allowed us to get ahead of the game plan. Um, to, to, to work the game plan and get way further ahead than you normally would be. And it allows you to spend a little bit more time with your family. Uh, Coach Herman's been awesome with that. So that's good, right? Those are the positive takeaways, silver linings, I guess. Um, not, being able to, not being able to see a quarterback live and in person is, is so important. Now, there are, there are different aspects um, of quarterback evaluations that are uh, more conducive to, you know, you can get a tight shot and they can give you all three angles and you can get their trainer video. And so it's almost like being there for quarterbacks, but you don't get to see the competition, right? You don't, you're not on the sideline um, when they're down 20 points or they're down a touchdown. How are they reacting in, in fourth quarter in a drill? You know, those are the things that you love to be around for and how do they interact with their teammates? You know, those are important things that you have to evaluate when you're looking at quarterbacks, which unfortunately you're not able to do. Um, so those, those are the, those are the things that, that you look forward to and um, to feel it and, and hear the sounds. That's part of the fun too. So it's uh, take the good, you take the bad. The reality is, is we're here and hopefully we move past this time and we can get on the road again soon. Steve, you're up. 
Hey, Coach, uh, just getting back to some things you were talking about earlier about game planning and stuff like that. How balanced are you about staying with what you have planned or going to an adaption? Uh, if things are working real well for you or making sure you get some things on tape for the other teams they have to prepare for in other weeks? I mean, talk about your process on that a little bit. That's an interesting topic uh, that you bring up and, uh, you know, putting things on tape for other people to defend. Um, to do that, you know, you, you got to make sure that it's helping you also win that current ball game. So you have to be very smart with that. If that's your intent, um, it, it, it should be a scheme or a formation that is also helping you build a victory in that particular ball game. But that is a that is a, an avenue of thought that you can go down. Um, I please uh, please help me understand your question a little bit more when you when you're talking about uh, you, the first part of that question. Well, you um, if you know something's working and you're running the ball to a certain guy to a certain side of the field or or certain off a certain route tree or something with with you're doing on offense or are you prone to just stay with that until they stop it or are you trying to get what you have in the game plan into the game? Great question, and uh, I apologize for making you repeat it. Um, so you, you want to keep them off balance. Um, so, yeah, there's there's part of you that just wants to continue to, to keep on hammering the play that's working. There's no question about it. But what the reality is, is p defenses are going to ad adapt real quick, and they're going to adapt fast. So it's usually, okay, what's the counter? You know, what's the counter to that play? What's it complement to that play? And that's any time you have – a play A in. You don't want to have play A, then play B, play C, play C, D, and, and so on. If you have play A and then play A1, play A2, play A3, so you're playing a playoff of play. And now you have a series, and now you have something that complements and you have defenders in conflict. Very important to establish that type of balance, uniformity, whatever. That's a system. And, and that's what we try to do for the most part. There's also going to be some situations where you're, you're running a few plays that don't really tie in with everything. That's going to happen as well. The most important thing is that you know the problems because there's always problems. What's the problems with this play? Well, it's whatever, safety blitz, right? Uh, this play, we're, we're, we're vulnerable here. If you go into it, yeah, I see a nice play on TV. Oh, great. Let's run that because it looked all fancy schmancy, right? Well, you take that play. Do you know the problems to it? If you don't, you have no business putting it in. You have to know the problems to either get out of it or to um, attack it, right, or to solve it. So that's kind of like a rule of thumb as, as you're instituting these plays. Have it packaged. Have complementary plays. The defense is going to quickly adapt. What's the counter? And what's, where are the problems? So that, that goes all into the thinking. Great question. Last question, Jake, go ahead. Hey, Mike. Uh, Josh Moore had quite the first game. When, when you first met him, what did you learn about, you know, his desire to move past some of the things from last year and just get back out on the field and start playing and do things like he did in game one? I missed the I missed the first part of it. Are you talking about Sam? No, Josh Moore. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Josh Moore. Um, Josh loves playing the game. And Josh is building a lot of confidence with how he's playing. So he had another great week of practice this week. Um, I think you're gonna continue to see him get better and better. Um, he loves he, like he likes to compete, man. You know, you can see that in his eyes, and and um, he's a great young man, and he's taking it all in. He wants to be good, and he's making he's making improvements. So, you know, the best is yet to come with him. But I, I think that he has a lot to prove. He has a lot of confidence, and um, he you know he's he's one of those guys that can't wait to show you again this weekend. So, he's fired up.